Hi everyone and thanks for joining us for this instalment of Capture Online and today it's all about food and drink photography and I'm going to be giving you some pro tips to get some insta worthy imagery. So I've been a photographer, a professional full-time photographer now for about 13 years and I do a real mix of people and also food and in fact it was people photography that kind of introduced me to food. I do personal branding and that kind of thing and I was photographing nutritionists and chefs and that leads on to doing very specific food work. Now at the very top level of food photography, you'll actually find that on a shoot there may well be a food stylist who's just there to look after the food, a prop stylist and you may be responsible for just the photography. However, loads of people who photograph food these days do it for blogs, for vlogs and indeed for Instagram and their own personal businesses. So they have to do it all and it's just really acknowledgement from me that that's a lot. Already this morning we've had to make the waffles, prepare the fruit, prepare the glassware and everything and the more prep you do in advance the better. The actual photographic element of food photography, it all happens really before you click the shutter. Whereas I find with people I tend to get them in and then things go from there. So it's a really really different approach. Today I want to cover off some kit and some basics including lighting, it's so so vital. I want to look at props and styling because honestly I believe it's absolutely fundamental to the success of food photography and then obviously we're going to dive into shooting some food and also quickly look at drinks which is obviously a whole subject on its own. Now due to the time of year, it's nearly Valentine's Day, we are focusing on love. So there's a bit of a theme going on which you will notice and also I'm going to be live at the end of the session to do some Q&A with you so hold those questions and I promise I'll do my best to answer them at the end. So first off I want to just touch on kit as I said cameras and lenses so I'm going to move all of this and I'm going to quickly talk about what I use and why. I turned a full-time professional about 13 years ago and at that stage I was actually shooting DSLR and Nikon. A few years ago I made a big big switch to the Alpha series mirrorless and I have to say it's been absolutely fantastic both for people photography where I love things like the eye autofocus but for food it's also excellent and today although we own a lot of the Alpha series bodies because we do a lot of filming and photography we being my husband and I and he's actually filming this today I like to use the A7R4 for, for food and the R stands for resolution and it's a basically a huge 61 megapixel camera which in a commercial sense is fantastic because it gives me huge resolution for print and I can crop in and create a number of images from a single image. Now the, the camera is actually up here, the, the R4 today on the overhead rig which I'm going to come to in a moment and you can see how small and compact they are. Now, when I'm shooting more and more these days, I tend to use my LCD screen to judge exposure, white balance, focus. You can see everything on mirrorless, which makes shooting so much easier. But I actually use some software that Sony provide called Image Edge, and it allows me to actually see what the camera is seeing, and I can adjust settings and even take the picture from there. So I find it really useful when I'm doing food photography to actually make any final adjustments here when I can see the image directly onto my laptop. Some of you will be using fairly basic cameras, which is absolutely fine. Some, I'm sure, even phones. And many of you will be using cameras which have interchangeable lens systems. So you're actually able to change your lens, change focal length and that kind of thing. For food photography, you'd be pleased to hear that if I was asked what one single lens I would use. It's actually one of the most affordable Sony lenses that there is and it's a 50mm f1.8 lens and it's actually on the camera now. Now the fact that it's just a 50 means it's a prime lens so it's a fixed focal length and it's got a really pretty wide aperture so it's fantastic for this kind of thing. 50mm is also the nearest to the human vision what you're used to seeing so you'll find it very familiar. We also own a different 50 which is here on the board and it's actually a 50 f2.8 so again it's a fixed 
focal length lens, but you'll notice that it says macro here. And macro actually means that I can get far, far closer to the subject and it enables you to get some really quite cool and different imagery. Macro photography is a little bit different though, so um, just be aware that you may have to have a good practice before you really get to grips with it. Another lens that I use an awful lot for food and drinks photography is the uh, 85 f1.8. Again, another really affordable lens from the Sony range. I do use different lenses, but I don't want to overcomplicate it today. One of the workhorse lenses I use for all my photography, but also food, is the Sony uh, 24 to 70, which is a much wider focal range, and that's an f2.8. We're obviously using it for filming today, so I can't show you it. And I do sometimes use my uh, Sony 135, which is an absolutely stunning fixed length lens, more for people photography to be fair, but sometimes I like to use it for food. But again, just to reiterate, I don't want you to worry too much about lenses. If you want to invest in one, then look at a 50, around the 1.8 mark, very affordable and great for what you need. Another really big difference between, say, people photography and food photography is the need for stability. Really, it's, it's vital. And when I started food photography, I just used a tripod. And there are loads of different ones on the market, but actually one like this, which is um, a Manfrotto, is excellent for this very reason. You can actually lift this central rod and bring it across like this. And what this enables you to do is kind of flat lay, the top down, which is hugely popular for Instagram, and this gives you that stability. And this was great initially, absolutely great, but I found in the end I kind of wanted to get the legs out of the way and be able to also have a greater range of height, so I asked Brent to create some form of rig for me. And again, listen, he just went into our kit room and had a dig around and fashioned this out of what we already had. So I'm not saying go out and spend a fortune on a rig, I'm saying think about the fact that you just need to be able to have the camera above and you need to be able to adjust the height. So he created this for me and we use it all the time. If you're using natural light, you may well find that your shutter speeds actually get really quite slow. And for that purpose, you don't necessarily want to be touching the shutter button of the camera. And that is again why I use the software that Sony provide, but the other option is to use some form of, say, remote trigger. Having now touched on stability and the camera and lenses, I want to talk briefly about, well, actually not briefly about lighting, it's the most important thing. As I've just mentioned, light is everything in photography and super important in food photography. Now light is light, whether you're using natural light, artificial light, lamps, torches, it's all the same. All of the physics is the same. What I want to do next is give you some real basics of lighting using an egg. I'm going to become known as the egg lady. I don't want the distraction of loads of food. I just want you to really, really concentrate because learning to see light is vital and when you know you can see it you know so if you're now thinking I'm not sure I can then that probably means in the nicest sense that perhaps you can't yet but I promise I think this is going to make a difference what I want you to focus on is not the light but the shadows we filmed this last night because I wanted it to be in darkness so I'm going to cut to that and then we'll come back to talk about lighting and modifiers one of the most important things you can learn to do is actually recognize whether the light you're working with is what we refer to as either hard light or soft light. Hard light being high contrast light and soft light being low contrast light. Now when we say hard light, it's all about the shadows and it was a big lesson for me early in my photography career to actually stop trying to look for the light and learn to look at the information that the shadows are giving you. And it's really, really helpful in food photography for you to do this. So if we're looking at the egg here, you can see we've got a totally bare, what we call a bare bulb, continuous light source pointing at it. And I want you all to look carefully at the line of the shadow. And when we're talking about hard light, it's, a, it's known as an abrupt transition, a very fast transition between light and dark. And that gives you hard light. Now there's a place for hard light in food photography. It can be really dramatic and fantastic, although most people have a preference for soft light. So the easiest way to create soft light is to actually modify this hard light source. 
Hard light is basically light which is hitting your subject at the same angle. So the easiest way to go from a hard light source to a soft light source is to modify it, to diffuse the light source. So think about the effect that the clouds have on the sun and actually the clouds merely scatter the angle of light rays so that when they actually hit the area around the subject they're coming in from loads of different angles. In photography this is often done through modifiers such as soft boxes and that kind of thing. In food photography a lot of people use sheets of diffusion material but honestly you can do it using shower curtains, all kinds of things. You just need a layer between the light source and the subject. All I'm gonna do now to show you the dramatic impact it has is put a simple diffusion panel between the light source and the egg. So you can see it coming in now. And the massive change that has made to the edge of the shadows. They are now very soft and in fact there's no hard edge at all and that is just with a single diffusion panel. In food photography a lot of people if they want very very soft light will what they call double diffuse and they'll use two layers to create something very very soft. So I've just referred to the importance of putting some kind of modification material between the light source and the subject. The other thing that is often done is reflecting the light source to lift the shadows. So opposite the light source, we use something like a, a white card or a reflector. And I'm going to show you the huge impact this can have. I've simply got a piece of white card and as I slowly move it towards the egg, I want you to watch the light on the egg itself those shadows reducing and reducing and reducing until almost all of it has gone. This is the role of a reflector. You can get reflectors in lots of different colours from whites to silvers to golds depending on what you're looking for. If you don't have a reflector with food photography I can't recommend enough putting a bit of tin foil around a chopping board and having a play. You'll be amazed at the results. The other thing that you might notice with food photography and indeed portrait photography is that people use big pieces of black card. And if you're wondering why, it's actually to do the opposite. It's about deepening the shadows. So a black absorbs light, does not reflect it back. So if you're wanting to really make any shadows super, super dark, then this is why people use pieces of black. Another really important way to change the quality of the light that you're working with is to think about the size or the relative size of the light source compared to your subject. And the reality is that the larger the light source, the softer the shadows. And this is a lot to do with the fact that a larger light source enables the light to wrap around the subject and therefore softens the shadows on the far side. So currently we have what I would still think of being a hard light source because it's, a, as you've seen, just a, a bare bulb continuous light source. However, we're gonna put a much smaller sort of light source right next to it and you, can, you will immediately see quite a dramatic change again in the shadows. So here you can see it's quite hard here and it softens and softens and softens. So now we're going to switch light source and wow, look at that. It's absolutely clean, sharp. There's a tiny bit of softening up at this end, but that is incredibly sharp and abrupt transition. So there you go. The, the lights are absolutely in the same place. One is much larger than the other and they're giving a very different shadow. So having spoken about the quality of light, it's now really important to talk about the direction of the light source because actually it's quite different between food photography and people photography. So let's quickly talk about people photography. Okay, I'm going to turn my egg into a face so that we can think about the differences between people photography and food photography. In people photography, there are basically three main directions of light that most photographers work with. And in its simplest, we're talking about front light, which is what you're seeing now, where the light source is directly in front of the subject and all shadows are cast behind. Now, obviously, depending on the time of day, that shadow behind changes massively from being nothing in midday sun to very long, deep shadows as the 
time of day changes. And you may want to think about that carefully with food photography. The next type of lighting that is used is side light. Now side light is something that I really wouldn't do very frequently with women. It's very harsh on skin. It makes people look super old. But if you're looking for mood and, and detail, then side lighting is fantastic. And it's something you can definitely think about with food photography. And then finally, we think about backlighting, where obviously the light source is directly behind. And you can see what happens that whilst you've got lovely rim lighting potentially there's an enormous amount of shadow on the actual if you like face of the subject and that is why people use reflectors because you can actually sort that out but it's um it's a it's something you have to really consider so for food we don't want to look at what we call boring flat frontal light because it will really make the food look boring and flat too for food we're looking at anything from side light round to direct backlight, particularly for liquids and drink. So it's much more this kind of area that you're thinking about working with. Now, as I said, particularly when you're working with backlight, mostly you're going to probably need some kind of reflector on the side opposite your light source to just lift those shadows and make the abruptness of the transitions much softer. You might be wondering why we now have an army of eggs and it's actually to try and in the simplest way introduce you to a really important concept in photography which is the inverse square law this is a homework alert for those of you that are interested honestly google it and have a good read but fundamentally we're looking at the concept of light drop off or fall off Here's the light source, everybody. And it's about how fast you lose the light once it leaves the light source itself. There's physics involved here, and it's definitely worth trying to understand it, but in its most simplest form, you lose 75% of the light very quickly, kind of here. And as you go further away from the light source, the light drop off is much more gentle. So what does that mean? It means that this egg here, the difference in exposure from the light side of the egg to the other side of the egg is very extreme because the drop off is very fast close to the light source. But as you move away, you'll see that the lights at the far end I've actually got a very similar exposure. There will be a tiny difference, but nothing dramatic. So what does this mean for food photography? It's about thinking about the distance from the light source if you're using side light, because you don't necessarily want half of the frame, let's say this half of the frame to be what we call hot, high in exposure, and the other side of the frame to be quite a different exposure. So considering we use side light a lot in, in food photography, I just want you to think about potentially moving your whole either setup if you're using natural light or your light if you're using continuous light further away from the actual subject if you want lovely even lighting across the frame. And it doesn't matter whether that lighting is soft light or hard light, the drop off rate is exactly the same. I've always loved working with natural light, but the reality with commercial work is you can't rely on it, particularly in the UK in the winter. We're in February now. So for food photography, when we're doing full whole days of food photography, we need the light to remain very consistent if we're doing a series for a chef or a restaurant or something. So we will always use artificial lighting, but we try and make it look like natural light. And we take our inspiration absolutely from natural light. The lighting kit that we use is Prophoto. The reason we love it is because it's both flash but it's also continuous lighting and it's temperature controlled, by which I mean we can go from anything from daylight, a very white light, through to a much warmer ambient light that you sometimes get in restaurants. Again, we use lots of modifiers and I hope that we've established why with the eggs. And you will have seen when we softened the light source, we actually use what's called a diffuser, a diffusion panel, and they're very, very common with food photography. Now, you don't actually have to go out and buy one of these. You can just take a trip to somewhere like Ikea and get a, a shower curtain. Anything which will allow the light to come through and be softened. So you don't want a heavy white sheet. You want something with a bit of um, opacity to it. We've touched on lighting. Now I'm gonna talk about styling. So I'm just gonna move all of this.
One of the most important discoveries for me with food and drink photography was actually a, a UK company called Photo Boards. They create these, which are fantastic. I've got a whole range of them and these are just a few. They are basically wipe clean, so really great for spills and the mess of food photography. And they come in all different designs. So I have got some quite dark ones. I've got also much lighter. These are just 30 centimeter ones and they may look really small, but actually they're great for backgrounds, particularly with drinks photography. And I've also got, you've seen obviously the white wood one we've been using all along, but here's a, one of my current favorites, which is a real kind of barn-like uh, wooden texture and you'll be amazed how realistic they look when you use them uh, in the right way with the right lighting they are you know honestly excellent can't recommend them enough I mentioned at the beginning how important styling is to food and drinks photography it honestly takes time and it's very personal or well, it's very personal when you're doing it for you and for your brand. When you're doing it for clients, you have to listen to what they want and be in line with what they want. It might not be your aesthetic, but you have to learn to do what's required. I spend a lot of time wandering around flea markets, looking at old cutlery, linen, interesting crockery, glassware. It's actually quite good fun. I also rely on places like TK Maxx and Dunnell because you'd be surprised what you can find at a really low cost. So go and have a dig around. I'm gonna show you some of the things that I love. Let's begin by talking reflections. They are the biggest problem in food and drinks photography. And what I mean by reflection is that you can see any light source that is in the room. So windows, actual lighting, and believe me, it can be a nightmare. So ideally, you want the matter surface the better. And I want to just demonstrate this below. So here you've got a, a very traditional glazed bowl and you can see the huge amount of hot reflections and that is literally windows. So there's a window over here and there's a window here. Whereas, on, and same with the fork, look how much it catches the light. It can be a real, real problem because that's where the eye is going to be led. Whereas here on the left, we've got a totally matte but lovely textured bowl and then a very old, old fork, which again, although there's a little bit of shine, much less than the one here. So can't recommend enough going for matte. If you can't actually find it very easily. There is something which helps, which is this anti-reflex spray. It does what it says on the tin, spray it on, and it will certainly mattify any really shiny things. But obviously it will affect the food, so don't be eating it afterwards. Finally, before we get on with the photography, quick look to show you a few of the things that I will use. As I said, I collect linens, all different colors, and it's not often that I would use a red, but because we've got a bit of a love theme today, we're going to have a touch of that in the props and the styling. And again, oh, these are the kind of things I pick up in, in flea markets, old kitchen tools, ceramics, just anything which is gonna to add to the actual story, if you like. I'd probably say this is maybe the thing you have to work the hardest at, it might really surprise you because it makes a huge difference, an absolutely huge difference. So honestly, if you want to improve your food and drinks photography, improve your styling. Moving on then from styling, we're starting with our first setup, which is the very popular overhead or flat lay look. Now, these are really important for storytelling and when you're photographing food, there's often not one image that you need, but a whole range. So this would maybe be the starting point of, of ingredients. In terms of styling then, the waffles are actually very flat rather than stacked because stacking doesn't work with an, with an overhead. And in terms of what I've done here, it's really very simple, but I'm using circles and you can see the repeat of circles in terms of the board, the bowl, and then, and then again here, the, the colour, we've got touches of colour coming in through obviously the fruit, but then again enhanced through my choice of linen. One of the little tips of the trade as such is to create a solution of glycerine and water 50-50 in just a fine mist spray bottle like this. Glycerine is very easy to get hold of, uh, it's actually a makeup product. And I pop it in here, mix it up, and then when you spray it, it looks a bit like condensation. So that effect of taking cold food and putting it into a warm environment. Again, you don't want to be eating it afterwards, so please bear that in mind, but this is about photography, this isn't about eating. So I'm just gonna spritz the strawberries and the blueberries just to give them a bit of a glisten. 
and then I'm going to talk to you about depth of field and camera settings. Camera settings then, it's a very personal thing. When I started out, I was very much in, in kind of P mode, letting the auto, letting the camera do everything. Then I switched largely into aperture priority and after that manual, and I've been fully manual for a long time now, but I don't want you to worry about that. It has to be what's right for you. There are obviously scenarios where aperture priority is really useful for food photography, and this is definitely one of them. I'm gonna explain why. And later we're gonna show where you might use something like shutter priority. So in a, a flat lay effect like this, your aperture is absolutely vital. And not in the sense that you might imagine. It's to make sure that everything is in focus because there is often height to flat lays and you don't want things to be out of focus say the top of the blueberries or even the board to be out of focus it's really really important that everything is in focus and there are actually things called depth of field apps calculator apps that you can get very easily on on the app store or something like that so i really recommend downloading one having a go because you'll learn an enormous amount about photography in the process so what you have to do is basically put in your focal length and as i've said earlier i'm shooting on a 50 millimeter lens so that's really important information and then you need to put in the the depth from the board up to the sensor so that's the distance from the camera fundamentally to the subject. And I need to know what height I require. So here's a little measuring tape and I'm gonna go from the board to the top of this bowl here. And that is six centimeters. And that also, let me just check over here. Do you know it's probably safer with this wooden stick to go to seven, seven centimeters. And I'm now gonna put that information into an app and it will tell me the aperture I need to ensure that all of that is in focus. So the distance from the board to the, the camera sensor, which um, is actually here, is 90 centimetres. So when I dial in my 90 centimetres or 900 millimetres and my 50 millimetre lens, it's saying that at f-stop of f4, when I put that in, I've got 70 seven millimeters so just over seven centimeters so that is probably fine but i think it's probably safer to go up to say f 4.5 so i'm just going to have a look at that and now yes that's now giving me uh 86 millimeters or obviously 8.6 centimeters so it's just a wee bit safer so there you go it's telling me that i need an aperture of f 4.5 and in aperture priority that's where you begin you dial that in and the camera will do the rest Remember, you want your ISO as low as possible. Because we've got stability here, go for 100. And it doesn't matter how slow your shutter speed gets as long as you're not gonna knock that when you click the shutter. So there we go, I've kept the lighting setup super simple. We have a, a single flash unit inside a softbox. The softbox is merely acting as a modifier, so there's one layer of diffusion. To, I want some shadow, but I just don't want it to be too strong. 45 degrees behind the food, and actually, because it's quite a light and airy shot, there's no need even to have a reflector in here. You may choose to, that's totally up to you. There's no right or wrong, remember. I chose waffles very specifically because they're a good food in the sense that they work for the overhead flat lay in this kind of setup. But if you want height, stacked waffles it does change things and it changes things because you immediately begin to see more of what's behind flat lays are dead easy because the rest of the room doesn't come into the image it's literally a camera overhead and you can work on boards like this the minute you start to bring your camera down to lower angles you have to consider the background so i'm going to quickly make a change to the setup it's almost the next stage in the story when someone's about to eat the waffles and we'll go from there we've now moved on to a stacked waffle shot and as i mentioned it's about now putting the camera on a tripod and going for a completely different angle. I specifically made sure with the angle of the camera that I haven't gone outside the board because I don't want to see the worktop surface. So there's an important piece of information in that I haven't gone too low and actually waffles and burgers can suit a total tabletop type angle and I'm going to show you that next. There it is. I've moved, so everything has switched around. So just imagine now that I'm gonna be working from here 
so I've just moved the light around to here, it's still backlight. It's not quite as downward, this time it's more skimming across the, the set and I've completely changed my settings. For this one I want the waffle and indeed some of this being drizzled to be the only thing in focus. So I'm working at 1.8. So an aperture of f1.8, which means a really small depth of field. You've got to make sure your focus point is absolutely on the area that you're going to drizzle. You could almost go into manual focus for that to ensure that the focus doesn't jump at all if you're using autofocus. And again, I've kept the lighting super simple. I don't want to overcomplicate it. You could totally do this with, with window light. Just imagine that this is a window here. And as I said, although I've changed my angle, I'm still staying within the photo board. I'm just gonna walk around to the other side now, everything's set up, and I'm gonna take the shot. I'm gonna take a clean shot and then one with a drizzle. You can see that once everything's set up, taking the shot is really quite fast. I'm really quickly just going to show you the importance of styling. I'm going to change everything fast so that we go from light and airy to something much darker. And I'm not going to change the lighting. I want you to see the impact that styling has without having to change the lighting. Okay, let's do it. As you can see, really quick set change. Light's where it was. I put a dark board, a photo board at the front here another dark photo board behind and I've changed the styling in the sense of changed the linen to something darker and changed the plate to something darker otherwise everything's the same okay and you'll see a very different type of image last thing I'm going to do I'm going to bring the laptop over so that I can both take the image and shake at the same time and that again is where remote triggers and that kind of thing can be a huge helping hand so I'm going to go that side take the shot shot done and my settings were f 2.8 ISO 100 and 200th of a second shutter, 200th because I wanted to freeze the concept of the icing sugar but only a little bit. 200th is a really nice amount when you're using flash. There's a slight bit of blur but nothing too snow-like. I also changed the setting of the camera so rather than just taking a single shot I was taking a number of shots in succession and there again it was important to have my shutter speed at only 200th because that enabled the flash to recycle very comfortably and I took about 10 shots and all of them were great and I've just chosen one of them to show you. Finally we're going to touch on drinks photography because lots of people who photograph food tend to also move into the area of drink but drinks photography is its whole own thing and it can be highly technical and the, the specialist drinks photographers are masters in reflection. Now, why do I mention that? Because reflections, as I said earlier, are a nightmare with not just cutlery and bowls and plates, but particularly, obviously, with glasses. And I just wanna show you what I mean here. So here are the glasses that we're gonna use for the, for the shot, but in our kitchen, we don't have blinds or anything. We love the light, not necessarily ideal for drinks photography. And all of these bright areas that you can see across the glass, these hot spots are just direct reflections of this window, that light source, that window. And it's incredibly uh, distracting and absolutely not what you want. You want to see the drink. You don't want to see these big areas of white. Obviously, with drinks photography, you, you might want one little strip to enhance shape and texture of the glass, but certainly nothing like this. So I'm quickly going to flip to a picture where a drinks photographer would start with lighting, but we're not going to overcomplicate it. We're going to use natural light, but this is just to warn you, look for those reflections. So how do you solve the reflection problem? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. You can't be shooting in a room like this. You actually have to be in a room where you have a light source, obviously, and that can be a window and that's what we're going to use, but where the rest of the room can be really dark. So you can shut curtains, shut blinds, or there isn't another light source because then it's just really straightforward. So we're going to go into literally a corner of a room in the house here where we have quite, got quite dark gray walls. And thinking back now to the eggs and the inverse square law and the drop off, remember, you'll see that I'm not going to put the glasses too near the window. I'm going to bring them much further into the room so that the, there's a lovely gradation of light on the wall behind but it's not too dramatic in terms of light to dark. So I'm going to make the drink quickly, move in there, take the shot.
as you could see with the drinks photo, it was more about the light than anything. The positioning and the styling kept super simple, wanted something quite dark and moody. And in terms of settings, it was 320 ISO, uh, f3.2, and one hundredth of a second, hence being still on the tripod. You could go handheld, but at a hundred, you're taking a bit of a risk. So, um, drinks photography made simple. You can see that we still get reflections in that image, but they're very specific and they enhance the image rather than distract, and that's what you're aiming for. Thank you so much for joining us on Capture Online. It's quite hard to cover food and drinks photography in such a short period, but I really hope that we've covered lots of different issues just to make you think fundamentally all photography is problem solving and that's the way you need to approach it. But I hope now you've got some new tricks up your sleeve so that you can solve the problems and produce some Insta-worthy photos. And on that subject, we would love you to share them with us. Here's our handle, so tag us and good luck with it. As you know, you can now join me live for a Q&A and I promise you can ask me whatever you want. There is no such thing as a stupid question. So see you shortly and cheers.